You ready, Schmooz? Let's do it. Let's do it. So, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas, they began a two-day summit in Panama hmm. uh, with the President Laurentino Cor Cor Cortizo. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. And officials from more than 20 countries. Uh, and, and the reason is, is for immigration. Because Panama has become a transit point for migrants seeking to come to the United States. So Blinken has called for more regional cooperation on migrants and refugees. Hmm. And you know what that really means? What? What do you think that means? More regional cooperation. It means the United States wants Panama and all these other countries to stop people from coming to the border. Mm. So when they say they want more cooperation, <laughs> that's political double talk for, I want you, you to stop, stop the people <laughs> before they come to us. Right. So uh, on Tuesday, Blinken said the United States and Panama signed an arrangement aimed at increasing, here's, a, here's some more political talk, yo, yo. Okay. So increasing some bilateral, bilateral cooperation to help stabilize communities. <laughs> that are hosting migrants and refugees. Hmm. Basically, they signed an agreement that says, Panama, stop the people from coming. Yeah. That was the agreement. Now, um, Blinken said this is the second agreement he's made. He made one with Costa Rica. So why do you think Panama is gonna wanna try to stop people from coming to the United States or migrating through Panama? Whether they're coming from other countries migrating north. Why do you think, Jonathan, they would do such a thing? I mean, that means that they have to have something in it for them, There's right? There's got to be in it for them, right? Right. You what know what's in be? it for them? What would it be? I don't... Moolah! The United oh. States is paying Panama $1.2 billion. Dollars. To do this? Well, I don't know what they're supposed to do with this one. It's $1.2 billion. Here's more political talk. Oh, wow. $1.2 billion dollars in assistance. In assistance. In assistance. Right. In assistance. <laughs> where is this? Where do you think $1.2 billion would the end leaders. up? It's not just Central. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not just Panama. It's all of Central America. Central, I feel like it's going to go to the wrong hands, though. Mm. It's going to go to leaders. That's what I but, think. But, 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 but basically, it's, <laughs> here's some money. So that's, that's their... That's their thing. Uh, that's what's going on there. And here's some... here. And by the way, at a press conference in Panama yesterday... Uh, Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas said uh, this about Cuba. Mm -hmm. You know, Cuba is the second largest group of people entering the country without inspection uh, in all of in all of the world. It's the number two more people, second only, I believe, to uh, I don't know what the first is, but I know Cuba is number two. Uh, second largest group, maybe Mexicans, may be the first. Hmm. Um, so, uh, at a press conference in Panama yesterday, Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas said, we have had, a, uh, had migration accords with the country of Cuba for many, many years. They were discontinued, and we're now going to explore the possibility of resuming that. I love all of this political double talk, yeah, right? Right. Uh, he says, this is a reflection of our commitment to legal, orderly, and humane pathways, so individuals, including Cubans, would not take, for example, to the seas, which is an extraordinary perilous journey. Uh, U.S. officials said they have seen a significant increase in an irregular and undocumented Cuban migrants headed to the United States. So what does that mean in political talk? They're going to open up the U.S. Embassy in Cuba and issue some more visas to people mm. so people don't have to hit the high seas, risk their life. I, like that picture right there. Like whenever right. whenever we talk about them hitting the seas, I'm kind of like, okay. But then that picture that we had just shown, this right here, this is what they're taking. That's crazy. Across, that's insane. That's like, that's, like a, that's like something you would put in a pool. Yeah. Right? Literally in a pool. Not even that because look, it's barely even floating. Yeah. Like that's in a pool. That's crazy. So now right. I really you risk, understand. You risk your life. Yeah. Right. But, but it's all, I love the political talk. That's what makes yeah, me it laugh. Is. Right. You know, we've had migration accords with the country of Cuba for many, many years. They were discontinued. We'll explore the possibility of resuming that. Like what? <laughs> Basically means that we're going to open up the U.S. Embassy and give some more visas. Yeah. Right. That's what they're going to do there. All right, and uh, and by the way, it came out through a Freedom of Information Act request that over the last decade, a growing number of American cities and states that have restricted the information 
local law enforcement departments are exchanging with immigration because of being a sanctuary city has been uh, that ICE has found a loophole mm. to get that information about people who are in detention. Now, what sanctuary cities are is that two things, Jonathan, okay. because we don't want this to, because the article or what's coming out in the news is saying that these sanctuary cities don't do anything with ICE. ICE had to now go hire private companies to give them information about people who have committed crimes in sanctuary cities and try to arrest them for deportation. A sanctuary city, the purpose of the sanctuary city is this. We don't want people in sanctuary cities don't want people who are out of status to be scared to use government services. For example, a government service that you would want to use is 911. Mm -hmm. There's a fire. We want to call in a fire before the whole block burns down. Well, if you're undocumented and you're scared you're going to call 911 to report a fire, that you're going to come and get arrested by ICE, you're not going to want to do that. It's the same thing with <clears throat> calling the police. You know, uh, if you witness a, a, a crime, the police want you to contact them. Mm -hmm. Another thing with sanctuary cities is that a lot of immigrants have been in the United States for long periods of time. Sometimes people have a bad night. Sometimes they get a bad night. They get into a fight with a right. relative. Right. Um, they get a, a DUI. That, because you have a bad night, doesn't mean you should now be thrown out of the country for the rest of your life and be separate and separate your family from yourself. I agree. So what they do in sanctuary cities is people who are arrested for minor offenses, misdemeanors, small offenses, they're not calling ice on them. People who are arrested for serious felonies, violent crimes. Those are the ones. Those are the ones that even in a sanctuary city, you're still getting, ICE is getting called in. But what ICE has been doing now is because on these minor offenses, on these minor offenses, they, they have now hired private companies who give them information about people who are arrested for minor offenses and are now finding these people, looking for them for deportation, even though the jurisdiction where, where the person was arrested is not coordinating with ICE. Hmm. For example, in Colorado, they passed a version of the sanctuary law in 2019. All the laws are a little different state by state, but generally that's what it is, okay? Your government's not gonna call immigration on you if you call for a government service, and the government's not gonna call immigration on you if you get arrested for a small petty, petty offense. Now, before Colorado passed its version of a sanctuary law in 2019, local law enforcement regularly shared information like probation schedules with ICE or granted requests to hold migrants uh, the federal agency was interested in. And getting picked up by ICE in the middle of probation appointments was not uncommon. I had that happen as in my practice of law all the time. Clients, I would always advise clients, hey, you're going to your probation. You may, you know, you may not walk out of that probation uh, appointment. Right. ICE might be waiting there for you. And usually it was at the end of probation they would always call ICE. Wow. Now, after the law was passed in Colorado, the share of detainer requests, that's when local law enforcement holds somebody to hand them over to ICE. Uh, they were refused by Colorado before the law, 19% of the time, but by 2020, almost 30% of the time. So now ICE is using private companies like LexisNexis, which is what we use at our law firm. Yeah. Uh, they're basically used by lawyers at big law libraries and databases. They're paying LexisNexis $17 million for real-time access to every court case and criminal case in every jurisdiction. Oh, wow. Because that's what LexisNexis does. It tells you what court cases are up. Mm -hmm. So when somebody comes and says, hey, do I have a court case? We look it up in LexisNexis or Westlaw or one of those other things. Now, we don't pay them $17 million. I don't know why the government's paying them $17 that's million. a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what they're doing right now. So even though, the point being is that even though you're in a sanctuary city and the local law enforcement is not sharing that information with ICE doesn't mean ICE doesn't know about it. That's the point of the whole thing. And by the way, it's Earth Day tomorrow. Ah. Did you know that? Nope. Isn't it coincidental that 
420 and Earth Day is in the same week? Do you find that? Is that a, any coincidental thing? I don't think so. I don't think that's a coincidence. Is, that, is, there, is there any I think correlation a, I between think 420 so, and I mean, Earth Day? Nature. Nature, right? That's what I, I, I said. <laughs> there's somewhere both, there's a correlation. They both come from the ground. Earth, yeah, Earth. right. I, you know, it's, right. You know, they don't say granola for nothing, there right? You go. <laughs> so just in time for Earth Day 2022, which is tomorrow, a report released today by the American Lung Association. And this is actually surprising that the United States saw the highest number of unhealthy and hazardous air quality days between 2018 and 2020 than ever before. Why now, is that how surprising? could that even be? Uh, you wonder why I find that? Why? Because we were closed for over a year. Everybody was sitting home in their homes. That's Nobody same, was driving. Same from 2018. To Nobody was driving. Nobody was doing anything. But oh, like Jill said, the yeah, Amazon yeah. packages, everybody was ordering stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, well, the theory is that Jill said in our ear, is that it was Amazon. Jeff Bezos polluted, I would, I, polluted, I would polluting be, the I would, environment. I would believe that. Because, because there, was, there was a 23-year decline up until the last two really? or three years. And also... I am kind of... Com I, I am surprised about that because especially I know my um, neighborhood in... Uh, just, just in in california you know a lot of people are starting to use like more smart cars and you know everybody's going through like that you know save the environment type of thing like changing their house uh you know with energy and in stuff california like that. they're doing this. yeah they're doing this in california but you, so. I, would you be surprised that the california is the most polluted state i would not be surprised would you be i, I would, grew up with smog so yeah. <laughs> would you would you be surprised that the cities that were the most polluted by year-round particle pollution were all in california no, I Bakersfield be. topped the list. Yeah. Followed by Fresno. Yeah. Uh, followed by San Jose, San Francisco, Oakland. Mm -hmm. And about 20 million people live in this area. Yeah. And the worst five areas for short term particle pollution was also Fresno, Bakersfield, Fairbanks. Fairbanks, Fairbanks. Alaska. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And then also followed by two other California areas San Jose, San Francisco, and Reading, Red Bluff. Reading, Red Bluff. Where's Reading, Red Bluff? It's probably all like a Northern California. Why, like, why? I wonder why Northern California is worse. Well, I mean, Fresno and Bakersfield, all those are like mid yeah. California. So like if you go there, you don't really see a lot of like, you don't see tall buildings and stuff. Right. It's a lot of open land. So they have a lot of factories and stuff like that Maybe. out there. Because I have cousins that are from Fresno. So yeah. I remember it's never like a huge city. So they will right. have factories and stuff. So yeah. I, I grew up literally and thinking that the sky is supposed to look right. like smog. And, and also <laughs> after a 23 year decline, it's also interesting that pollution went up during the years of the Trump presidency. Coincidence mm. or no? No. Now, that's not a coincidence. 137 million Americans live in counties with unhealthy air. People of color are disproportionately affected by pollution. 61% of people of color are more likely than white people to live in a county with a failing grade for at least one form of pollution. Yeah. And by the way, ozone, also bad. Uh -oh. The worst cities for ozone, Los Angeles, Long Beach, Bakersfield, Fresno, and Phoenix, Arizona. Hmm. Well, 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 well. Sorry, well. guys. And it's wild. <coughs> it's wildfire season, oh, Jonathan. Oh gosh, that's right. all in California we're, too. We're, we're going to start seeing. Remember those pictures where it looked like a um, yeah, like hell, like, like hell. Remember yeah, that from like two that years was ago? Scary. We're going to start seeing them all over oh, again very man. soon. Why? Because it's it's wildfire season. That's what happens now. Uh, there's now eleven large wildfires burning across the southwest. And Southern Plains, uh, including what's called the Tunnel Fire near Flagstaff, Arizona. 19,000 oh acres goodness. of land are burning right now in uh, near Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, today, 8 million people in the United States are under fire alerts, including in New Mexico, Western Texas, Nebraska, Wyoming. And why? Dry conditions, yeah. low humidity, gusty winds, near record setting high temperatures, an extraordinary pollution. Yes. Combination of all of that. It's like a good, it's like a good soup or a good mm. salad. But it's not. But it's not. <laughs> but that's what happens. Yeah. That's always scary for us because we live in a neighborhood where our whole neighborhood burnt down in like 2017, mm -hmm. I think. So I don't like hearing about that. And by the way, where we are right now, where our office is in downtown Manhattan, we're below sea level. We get, you know, there's a big storm that hits New York City. Mm. All of lower Manhattan gets flooded out. Oh, wow. Yeah, where you are up in Harlem, 
It's you're okay. okay. You're on top of the Oh, hill. so that's why, like, whenever there's flood in uh, New York, like, it'd it be flooding over here. But, yeah. like, in Harlem, I'm, yeah, like, yeah. we walking around. Right. It's, like, it's don't just you, a little bit you, of rain. Yeah, <laughs> don't, right. Don't you ever notice that as you get into uh, the Upper East Side and you start walking into the yeah. 80s and 90s, you start goes, walking uh, uphill? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. we don't get flooded out. Yeah, you're home. you're like you're, you're on top of the hill looking down. Yeah, saying hey, hey you, y'all. You, got, you guys downtown by the studio and Spartan Prince's office. <laughs> right, put on your galoshes. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, by the way, the death toll. Talking about floods, you see, this is awful. What happened in South Africa? No, it's barely in the news because of, I didn't even because know. everybody's talking about the Ukraine. Oh, but 443 people have died. What? 63 other people missing. In the deadliest storm on record in South Africa. Oh my God! Yeah, tens of thousands of people have been left homeless. Five hundred fifty schools are damaged. What? Sixty healthcare facilities are damaged. And the South African government has said they they they, they need at least an immediate one billion dollars in emergency wow. relief. And now the full extent still hasn't been determined. The area in question is called KwaZulu Natal Premier. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, KwaZulu Natal. That's the area it is in. It's in the province of KwaZulu. If I'm pronouncing it right, KwaZulu Natal. Natal. Yeah, and the premier, the okay. I guess the governor of that area said billions are going to be required to build back the province from this catastrophe. Uh, when asked if climate change played a role in the flooding, the South African Weather Service replied. Duh. Right. No, they didn't say duh. Uh, <laughs> but I say duh. They said they actually said that they can't attribute any particular event to uh, oh, to uh, climate change. But overall, there's been a lot of crazier weather. I would say, I agree, you can't you can't particularly say this storm is because right. of climate change. Right. But I, what you can say is that we've had about X amount of storms more this year than we had the year before. Those storms have been more violent, more deadly, more lethal, and every year, it gets worse and worse mm-hmm. that uh, on overall overall you can attribute to climate change yeah you want to know what's strange what the most trusted source of news according to uk market research firm YouGov in the entire world i'm say tmz no it's not <laughs> it's the weather channel what they are the most trusted source of news in the survey of fifteen hundred, uh, at least in the United States, not around the world, in the survey of fifteen hundred United States adults taken between March twenty sixth and March 29th, the network was found to be trustworthy by fifty two percent of respondents. Really? Yes. Uh, the New York Times did not fare very well. Um, only sixty three percent of Democrats said they trust it, and only fourteen percent of Republicans say they trust the New York Times. CNN did not do very well. Sixty-five percent of Democrats say they trust it, and only eleven percent say they don't. Which is odd because they said the most trusted news personality in the United States is Anderson Cooper, who's at CNN. Mm. I don't get weather news. When I say I don't get it, I never listen to that. Let me let me explain to you something, Jonathan. Do you care what the barometric pressure will be today? No. Do you care where the winds are coming from the south, no. the north, the east, and no. the west? No. Okay. I find the entire weather report stupid. I don't find the I entire. Fought, I, I find the only thing. Because I like I, to know if it's going to rain or the not. Only, I was about to say, the, the weather report. <laughs> that's all I need. The weather. And, well, that's what I was about to say. They spend five minutes with barometric pressure. Yeah. Okay. The wind. Here's the clouds. Here's this low front, the high front, the medium front, whatever they call it. Who cares? This is what we need to know. It can be done in two sentences. And here's Tom with the weather. Tomorrow it's going to rain. It's going to be 50 degrees. Wear a sweater. Back to you, Joe. That's all, that's that's all that's you all need, need to know, that's all right? I, need. That's all. I wanted to uh, comment on the South African uh, yeah. story. Brown wind, whitehead. You know, anytime we have somebody comment that is from the actual country oh, yeah, yeah. saying it's terrible and, uh, and South African government does not supply help, do not send money at the government pockets. It, wow. Uh, South Africa government steals money all the time, especially aid. I'm from there and have family there. No climate change. This happens every 10 years due to African rain and drought seasons happened when I was five as well. But not as bad as now. But, mm, I think it's getting worse. Probably. I think I would say it's getting worse. And but thank prob- you for that. And probably my guess would be 
that if these were floods in Cape Town, no, right, and had. not and not out yeah. in the bush or right. wherever, they, they I don't know had. where the Zulu province is, mm. but it's not in the wealthy, I would presume, the wealthy part of South Africa. Right. I would, would say, would I, would say okay. I would say, if it was in Cape Town, they'd see a lot more aid coming in. Absolutely. Right? I, I was already thinking that from the, in the yeah. beginning. All right. All right, you ready for some wacky world news? Yes, let's, let's do, do it. Let's do it. So, Jonathan, I don't know if this is wacky, but I would say this is absolutely insane in the membrane. Okay. What is A 60-year-old man has vaccinated himself against COVID more than 90 times. Huh? 90 vaccinations in order to get COVID-19 cards and resell them to people who don't want to be vaccinated. This happened in Germany in the town of Magdeburg. That is insane. You injected yourself 90 times with COVID vaccine? That's, that's just dumb, guys. Well, he yeah. made, I guess he made money. Uh, now, uh, DPA, which is the German news agency, they reported that the suspect was not detained but is under investigation. He was caught at a vaccination center in Ellenburg in Saxony when he showed up for a COVID shot for the second day in a row. Police confiscated several blank vaccination cards from him and initiated criminal proceedings. It was not immediately clear what impact the 90 shots is going to have on this man. Oh, my God. Be and the reason you have to have it is because if you want a valid vaccination card, you need the, the, the bin number of where the COVID yeah. shot came from. So these were real COVID shot bin numbers, but didn't go into the body of, of the person who, the person who got it. Wow. Is that insane? That's dumb. That's just dumb. Well, I, well, the only thing that, that I would say that Jill just said in my head, if you ever wanted any proof that COVID vaccines won't kill you, the guy's still alive. For how long? I don't know. And like, we don't know what, what kind of effect this is going to have on his body or what it's doing to his organs. Come on. Well, I, can I tell wouldn't you, even take that risk. All I can tell you is I took a vaccine booster and I couldn't get out of bed for four That's days. That's what I'm saying. Like, so I don't know what that... This guy this when guy I is got like the Superman vaccine, of antibodies. Yeah, when I got the vaccine, I was more sick than when I actually had COVID. Exactly. So I don't know. This is just... That's, that's crazy, guys. Don't please do not try that at your local hospital. Right. And here's here's a, here's a way, by the way, Jonathan, to avoid COVID. Hmm. We have a new way now. What? You can buy the world's loneliest home. It's on a deserted island off the coast of Maine. You are there by yourself. You will never get COVID. <laughs> it's a one-bedroom home, completely isolated on a deserted island off of Maine, uh, known as Duck, Duck Ledges Island. The listing notes it's offered in its entirety. The property sits on one and a half acres. There's not a sign of oh civilization anywhere. Uh, the listing states the ledges surrounding the island are located with seals for constant entertainment. It has no trees. It offers views of nature that you can't find anywhere else. The cottage, according to the listing, is the world's loneliest home, built in 2009. It's only 540 square feet. The home does not have a bathroom. It has a detached porta potty on the island. For those who need to go in the middle of the night. Do you see this? It is the world's loneliest island, the world's loneliest home, and it is, can be yours, Jonathan, for $339,000. I was about to say, that's a good price until I saw it. $339,000. You got me messed up. But it's an island. You would have to knock down the house and somehow put in some bathroom and... So Plumbing like if you knock down, so this is. I thing. don't even know where they get electricity from on this lonely island. Right. If if I knock down the house, build like this like mini mansion on this right. island. But you know how expensive it would be to build a mini mansion because you have to you have to bring all the workers in by boat right. and bring and all, all the, the supplies and where are you getting electricity from? And then from? I would be nervous like if it. And there's not a lot of space there. Yeah. It's the no. world. And what what about the poor? What about the poor seals who are watching all of this? <laughs> Uh, I, well, I'll skip obviously, it. I'm, I'm, yeah, it. I'm a city boy, so you know I don't what? know what to uh, you say. You know what? I'm going to skip that investment. What about you? I'm a city boy. Yeah, I'm <laughs> like I said, investment. yes. Okay. And by the way, there's a UK professor. 
Oh, this is what we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, he's taking it back, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. He said the Loch Ness Monster, you know, the famous Loch Ness Monster, yes. was in fact a lonely whale's penis That's what looking around <laughs> for some, some bo a booty call. <laughs> And everybody on Twitter was starting to believe this it. Is, so this is they what I saw. They were saying the Loch Ness Monster was just basically a, a horny whale. <laughs> but what it turns <coughs> out is that Michael Sweet, the molecular ecologist, is wrong. You want to know why he's wrong? Why? Because Loch Ness is a lake. It's fresh water. And oh, whales, no whale. whales live ah. in salt water. So he floated the controversy on April 8th. He got over a hundred thousand likes. Everybody That's what thought. I saw. Everybody thought it was finally solved. The Loch Ness monster. I thought so too. I was like, yeah. "Wow!" But yeah, that makes but, sense. But but apparently he said he described Michael Sweet. He described in a subsequent tweet why blue whales like to breach uh, penis first. You know, go up penis first. Whales often mate in groups. So while one male is busy with the female. The other male just pops his D-I-C-K out of the water oh while goodness. swimming around, waiting for his turn oh. when the female's done. The female goes from man. The female's female is the female's having fun. The female is loose, man. No, she That's having fun. That's a loose whale. <laughs> she, she is having that fun. That is a loose whale going that from... Sounds going, like <laughs> Sounds like a good time, okay? <laughs> Females just having a good time. That's yeah. what we call it. <laughs> now, Michael Sweet, he, he's the way he, he's taking it back, he said he firmly believes that the Scottish monster is a hoax that since retracted his theory, he said, I use the image of Nessie, uh, I guess the that's the whale, yeah. just, no, as, the, the, just as an example of what people use to describe sea monsters, monsters looking like. But Nessie was a poor choice to use in this instance, given the absence of whales and Loch Ness. Sometimes you got to mm -hmm. think before you tweet. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if this is a gross story or a sweet story oh, or something in the middle. A bored and homesick English woman living in Africa became a human, human nest for a weakling finch bird for nearly three months. And now has written a book about the bird living in her hair. Hannah Bourne Taylor, a London-based photographer and copywriter, told The Guardian each day he made little nests in my hair on the groove of my collarbone, which filled me with awe. He disgusting. tucked himself under a curtain of hair and gathered individual strands with his beak, sculpting them into a round of woven locks resembling a small nest, then setting inside. She basically let a bird live in her hair. And she fell in love with this bird. And she took care of this bird. Where did the bird poop? <laughs> all over her probably <laughs> eventually where, where do birds usually poop when they have a nest yeah in their well nest? she's the lucky you know what they say if your bird poops on you that's luck she must be the luckiest person in the world um eventually after three months the bird was able to join the bird flock and left her and she has been very sad since he's never come back to or she's never come back to visit this woman but she wrote a book about it about how it changed her life with a bird living in her hair Y'all already know how I feel about birds, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's a no for me, guys. It's a no. <laughs> you would not allow a bird to live in your Absolutely right. not. Do we have... Look. There, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> see? Y'all yeah, wouldn't even let a bird... The Near other me. Wouldn't Do you even see let that? a bird Do you him. see the birds attack me? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> oh, man. You know, some videos, Jonathan, will live in infamy. That, <laughs> that one, can live for free. That, in that one's in infamy. We've shown that for years. We still get a laugh. The one with you running down the street in your <laughs> underwear, that one's going to live in infamy. <laughs> and uh, finally, Jonathan, our last wacky world news story, a London couple claimed their hellish neighbor installed a mannequin to stare into their bedroom from Ooh. their loft window and sued him <laughs> for invasion of privacy. <laughs> Because the mannequin was staring at them through the window. It's kind of creepy looking. Oh, whoa. That's kind of creepy looking. Oh, no, that's, they that's said, they creepy. said They said that the mannequin, they, they got so creeped out by the mannequin that they had to close their shades. <laughs> they had to get dressed, you know, behind doors and closets because this mannequin was just peering at them the whole entire time. That's, what? Look at it. To add insult to injury, the owner of the mannequin... 
His name, his name is Simon Cook, added a blonde wig, making it appear that someone was watching over their every move. According to the lawsuit by Rosie and Christopher Taylor, they're from New Zealand. We can't take a shower. We can't get dressed without being overlooked. It's essentially like living in darkness with curtains down. Their case got thrown out. Yeah, because it's a mannequin. It's a mannequin. The only thing I would say, the only thing I would say is it just would make you uncomfortable because they could, you, the person could, whenever they feel like it, move that mannequin and actually be him, you know, looking. Maybe that so person like, is the mannequin and he's just standing still. No, no. That's yes. obviously a mannequin. You don't right know there. that's obvious. You can't tell from that, across the street. That person can put some makeup on and no, just sit that, there and stare that, at them that all looks like, day long. That looks like a mannequin, but from anybody, far, from anybody far, who puts a mannequin like that in their, in their window, I wouldn't put, I would put anything against them. Yeah. <laughs> I would move out of that neighborhood. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Yeah, sp yeah spooky. That's like a spooky. That's spooky as that's hell. That's a spooky movie. Yeah. That's like sure. out of a spooky movie. Yeah. Right? And, and of course, it would happen in like a spooky town in the yeah. UK, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -mm. Thanks for watching. For more Bradshaw Live, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.